we're going to look at the different forms of energy that particles can have and we're going to look specifically at how we can calculate the work done by a force on a particle, um, what kinds of energy a particle can have. We're then going to look more generally at systems of uh, multiple particles, so we're going to look at internal energy and finally finish off by having a look at the first law of thermodynamics and how that gives us the principle of conservation of energy. Okay, so let's make a start. So first off, what is the work done by a force? So let's define it to start with. Um, so it's the product of the force and the displacement of the object parallel to the direction of the line of action of the force. So that's a lot of new words at once. So let's have a look at the diagram on the right hand side. The line of action of a force is just a line that extends um, forward and backwards from the force. So you can see it's that red dashed line there. That's what we'd call the line of action of a force. And then so displacement parallel to that would be um, in the same direction of the force. It might not be a in line with the force, but it would be parallel to that direction. So how can we actually calculate the work done? Well, if the force is constant, we can calculate work done using W equals Fs, where um, F is the force and S is the displacement parallel to the force. If the force is not constant, we have to use some calculus or specifically integration to calculate work done or effectively what we're doing is working out the area under a force versus displacement parallel to the force graph. And that's what we can see there at the bottom. But um, at the year 12 level, most of the times you'll come across it are when the force is either constant or you have a graph you can work out the area with. Integration tends to come a bit later on. Having said that, let's look at, have a look at an example where we might apply integration. So, so far you may or may not have looked at springs, um, but we can use this idea of work done to define our first kind of energy. So, the elastic potential energy stored in an object is calculated by uh, working out what the work done is to stretch a spring from zero extension up to a certain extension. So, um, those of you who've learned about springs already will know about Hooke's law, which says that the tension force in a spring is equal to a constant times the extension of a spring. So we said the work done is the integral of the force uh, with re respect to displacement parallel to the force. So the force and the displacement are going to be parallel to each other because the force is going to be downwards to stretch the spring we can see and the displacement is going to be downwards too. So we don't need to worry about direction here. We said it's going from unstretched, so the starting limit of your integration will be zero. We're going up to an extension x, so we're going to integrate kx with respect to dx between zero and x, which when we do that would be half kx squared minus zero, so half kx squared. So this is the elastic potential energy stored in a stretched object that we've calculated using our integration. The next kind of energy we're going to come across is GPE or gravitational potential energy. So this is defined as the work done to move the center of mass of an object or where the weight force acts from, from a certain point that we define as zero GPE. So typically we uh, at this level of mechanics, we say ground level is zero GP. Um, in when we start to look at gravitational fields in year 13, we'll use a different zero. But at this point, the zero point is ground level. So um, essentially what we're going to do is look at a mass moving from uh, height h to ground level. And the force this time acting on it is weight force. And weight force is constant, so we can just calculate work done by force times displacement, which would be mgh. So this is how we calculate gravitational potential energy. It GPE is equal to mgh, and h is the vertical height above the zero GPE level. So we've got elastic potential energy and gravitational potential energy. The last form.
look at is the kinetic energy of an object. So this is defined at the, as the work done to accelerate an object from stationary to a certain velocity. So um, we're going to start with the general equation. The work done is the integral of the force uh, with the respect to the displacement in the direction of the force. Um, but the thing is, we're accelerating an object. We're going to use Newton's second law, F equals ma. So we're going to integrate ma with respect to ds. So this is where we have to perform a little bit of um, algebraic jiggery pokery. So we know that a is equal to dv by dt. So then what you'll see on the second line of working is I've switched the ds and the dv. And ds by dt is just the velocity. So we can actually integrate mv with respect to dv, uh, which we, is where half mv squared comes from. And we've got the limits because it said we start from stationary and end up at a certain velocity v. So that's where the limits come from. Um, so that's how we get the equation for kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy or the movement energy of an object is calculated using half mv squared, where v is the velocity of the object, or we can use the speed. It doesn't really matter. So let's put all of that together. So if we have a system of many particles, we have something called the internal energy of that system. And the internal energy is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy of all the particles in the system. And the potential energies might be in the form of elastic or gravitational potential energy, um, but typically we would come across mostly GPE in this topics. Later on in year 13, you'll come across more forms of energy like electric potential energy, for instance, but we're not going to worry about those too much now. And the reason we can add all these different forms of energy together to get a certain value is because energy is a scalar quantity. So the direction or the type doesn't matter. We can just add them all together nice and easy. So let's have a look at an example here. So we've got um, two particles here. So let's have a look at the particle on the left. So we've got a two kilogram object raised above ground level. So this object would have GPE because ground level we say is zero joules of GPE. It's eight meters above that. So we know it's got GPE, but we can see from the velocities uh, that we get there that it's stationary. So it would have no kinetic energy. It's not attached to any springs. It's not been compressed or anything. So it has no elastic potential energy. On the other hand, the three kilogram object we can see here is at ground level, which we define as zero GPE. And we can see this traveling at five meters per second. So we know it's got kinetic energy. So if we want to work out the internal energy of the system, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out the total energy of each of the objects and we're going to add them together. So the two kilogram object, we said had no kinetic energy, but it has GPE, which you can see we've calculated there. The three kilogram object has no GPE, but it has kinetic energy. So we've calculated that. Eternal energy is the sum of all the energies of a system. So we've added those values together and we'll give it to two significant figures because all the information we've been given for this question was one significant figure. So a two significant figure answer would be appropriate there. So that's the internal energy of those two objects together. So why have I been talking about internal energy? Well, we're doing that so we can link into something called the first law of thermodynamics. So this law says that to change the internal energy of a system, you can either do work on the system using external forces, or you can supply heat energy to the system. If we do neither of those things, the internal energy of a system must stay the same. And we're going to be using that principle um, in a bit to give us the expression of conservation of energy. So that's the first law of thermodynamics there. So what do we mean by external forces there? How are they different to just forces, for instance? So. An external force is one that can cause the internal energy of a system to change. Another kind of force known as an internal force doesn't change the total internal energy, but it can cause it to be transferred between types of internal energy. So to give you an example, the weight force of an object causes 
the GPE to be transferred to kinetic energy. That's why objects fall. But because those two are both types of internal energy, that doesn't cause a change in the total amount of internal energy. It just transfers between them. So weight force, we say, is an internal force. A reaction force between two objects can cause the internal of an object to change. So it might cause the kinetic energy to increase, um, but not lose any GP or any other kind of force. So we would say that's an external force. And sometimes when you're reading textbooks, you might find internal forces referred to as conservative forces or external forces referred to as non-conservative forces. Those two mean the same thing. It's just so if you come across this elsewhere, you know what that means. So give some examples of forces that we've come across so far, which would come under these different categories. Weight force, uh, tension and thrust force are all types of internal force. So a weight force transfers between GP and kinetic energy. A tension or a thrust force transfers between electric, elastic potential energy and kinetic energy. Um, so that would be to do with springs. Forces that cause the internal energy to change. Friction and air resistance would act to decrease the internal energy of a system. Uh, reaction forces or contact forces can either increase or decrease the internal energy. And compressive and tensile forces can act to increase the uh, elastic potential energy of a system. So um, those would be some external forces. So this has been building to this slide right here. The expression of conservation of mechanical energy. So the principle of conservation of energy states that the total mechanical energy or the sum of all of the energies of an isolated system remains constant. That's the principle of conservation of energy. So what do we mean by an isolated system? It's a system that's not experiencing an external force and that there's been no heat transfer to that system. So resultant force, hopefully you've come across already, is the sum of all the forces acting on a system. So if there's no resultant external force, there are either no external forces or they all cancel each other out. And the reason it says mechanical energy in the statement at the top is because in mechanics we don't really deal with heat transfer. That comes later in year 13. So we will often refer to internal energy as mechanical energy to indicate we're not thinking about heat transfer involved there. So that brings us to a finish. That is the expression of conservation of energy. Just quickly review what you should be able to take away at this point. So at this point, you should be able to define and calculate the work done by a force, both when the force is constant and when the force is not constant. You should be able to define and calculate GP kinetic energy and elastic potential energy for particles. Um, you should be able to define and calculate the internal energy of a system of particles. And you should be able to tell me what the first law of thermodynamics is and give some examples of internal external forces and explain how that leads to the principle of conservation of energy. If you can do all those things, great, you've got all you need. If there's any of those things you're like, huh, what's that? I don't remember that at all. It's time to go back through the video or use a textbook to look those things up because you need to be able to do all of these things. OK, so that finishes this video looking at energy. I hope you found that useful to get an introduction to this topic. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please do comment on this video and ask. I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. But thank you very much for taking the time to watch.